Well, hello, Jennifer. Thank you for joining us today and being part of Agility Prime. Of course, my pleasure. Nice to be here. Uh, so uh, can you tell us uh, what brings you with us today? Yeah, great. Well, um, you know, similar to what we were hearing about on the prior session um, and the focus on trying to leverage commercial technologies, commercial networks to support this whole new generation of unmanned aircraft. Um, this is an area where I've been working really for the last six, seven years, working on communication solutions for unmanned aircraft, including um, advanced air mobility. And um, we're, we've been looking at all different kinds of solutions. So working with government and industry and NASA on all the various kinds of solutions that can be brought to bear to solve the issues that we need to solve. So we need to figure out um, how, we, how we're going to accomplish command and control or some measure of that. Um, how will we accomplish um, detect and avoid? Um, remote ID. How will we link in with the UTM system and how will that talk to the ATM system? And what kind of you know, network support is needed um, in order to ensure safe and reliable communications among the aircraft and with the aircraft and uh, the systems on the ground. So there's, there's just a tremendous amount to do. I will say NASA has been really forward looking on these issues um, and has been looking actively at how can we leverage commercial technologies in this particular area, this CNS area. Um, but gosh, there's so much that remains to be done. So um, I'll kind of break it into two parts um, and happy to answer questions that people might have about these two different areas that, that we have that we really have to focus on as, as an industry, as a government, um, in order to be able to support this new um, generation of aviation. Um, honestly, if we don't solve these communications issues, we won't have an industry. So really, really important that we focus on the issue. So in the two, the two categories are sort of what are the practical things that we need to do in order to validate and prove the kinds of technologies that can be used uh, to satisfy all these different functions. Um, and then what are the regulatory things that we need to accomplish in order to enable it? So starting at the beginning with the, um, the practical things that we need to do, um, you know, we're looking at using commercial wireless networks and commercial network technology and, and really the whole communications infrastructure that exists today, including fiber optics and edge computing and cloud computing, all these technologies that we otherwise use will be brought to bear and will be leveraged for um, advanced air mobility. How can we do that in a way that's safe and secure and reliable? Um, so there's the architecture piece and then there's the testing piece. You know, what kinds of testing and validation needs to be done and by whom? Um, do our regulators need to do it? The FCC, the FAA, does industry need to be doing it? Do bigger standard setting bodies need to be doing it? Probably the answer is yes, all of the above. Um, we also have to be thinking about interoperability. So um, no one solution is going to be the solution. Many different communication solutions are gonna to come together to support these vehicles. So there might be a role for unlicensed spectrum and technologies. Um, there might be a role for the commercial wireless networks, as I suggested earlier, satellite, uh, aviation protected spectrum, all of it is, is important and plays a role. So for example, you might want to use your um, aviation protected spectrum for takeoff and landing. But in between, you might, which is sort of less safety critical, you might be able to use the commercial wireless networks and some kind of handoff. You might need to connect with satellite networks if you get into a remote area where there isn't good cell coverage. <clears throat> so all of these different solutions really do need to work together and be interoperable. And not just here in the US, but globally, um, because this is a global market um, and we need to have solutions for unmanned aircraft and eVTOLs that um, can work from country to country. And right now, at least in terms of the spectrum solutions, there really isn't that kind of harmonization and, and that also needs to occur. <clears throat> and then there's standards that need, standards need to be set. So 
For example, if you're going to use commercial wireless technologies to support command and control functions or remote ID functions for, um, or detect and avoid for an eBTOL, um, and you're using those networks that are used today just for commercial cell phone use, what changes to those networks need to be made in order to enable that uh, use for the aircraft and to make it safe? So how um, can, so, oh, yeah. sorry, so what do we, um, what needs to happen for those standards to come into place? Like uh, how, who's working on that right now? Yeah, uh, two different groups at least are working on it. So RTCA um, is just beginning some new phase work that is going to be looking at, for example, the commercial wireless networks and the standards around that that might need to be set. Um, so that's, you know, within the aviation industry, outside of the aviation industry, uh, 3GPP, the third generation partnership project, which develops all of the standards for cell phones. Um, has been working on this as well. And so what did they, they've been working through, how did they need to change their standards in order to enable this new use of the wireless network? Um, and then there are a bunch of other working groups. So, you know, we've just finished, um, ANSI just finished their roadmap 2.0 and we put in a big section on spectrum, spectrum issues and technology issues similar to what I'm discussing here. Um, yeah, so as you mentioned, the, the, somebody's addressing the spectrum issues. So we have a question, what features will orbs depend on? So um, is, is the uh, 5G and other sp spectrums going to affect them? Do we know that? Um, I'm sorry, just repeat that question again. I think I didn't catch all of it. Oh, okay. So like, do we know like if the the 5g spectrum is going to affect orbs is it going to help them uh, yeah bandwidth with issues so we don't think there will be loading issues on the network that will cause um in the near term issues with functionality of the network either as it's used on the ground or in the air because we have to remember that these uses will be happening simultaneously um, Qualcomm had a study out a number of years ago that showed that they believed that the uses could happen simultaneously ground and air using 4G networks without really having to change anything about the network. But as we get more and more unmanned aircraft in the air, including eVTOLs, and, and by the way, the commercial networks have been tested up to 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 feet with reliability without even changing the way the networks are constructed today. And so they really are looking at it at, you know, decent altitude. Um, we don't think right now anything needs to be changed, but when we get to loading and we get to a lot more aircraft in the air, then certainly there will need to be changes, software changes, hardware changes in the network in order to accommodate uses in the air and on the ground. It seems like like right now would be a perfect time to be testing everything without like the airspace full. Yeah. Uh, is there anything ready to be testing right now? There are some metrics that we worked through with the FAA um, to, to study uh, that and to make sure that information about the testing is coming back to the FAA in a manner that is somewhat standardized and can be um, utilized um, and studied and understood so that they can develop the right regulations around this. Um, so the IPPs are studying it, foreign governments are studying it, I think it's widely used in Switzerland. Um, it's widely used in the UAE uh, for years. Actually, they've had a, a system. It's a it's a remote ID system and a UTM system, both that are utilizing the commercial wireless networks, and they're using just 2G or 3G technology, not even 4G or 5G. Yeah, and still getting really tremendous results with that. And they don't need that much data, is what they've learned. So mm -hmm. when I it was inquiring with them about, you know, how much data and is this expensive? They said that they buy the data plan from the wireless carriers and it's such a small amount, you, you almost can't get a plan small enough. Now that's probably okay just for 
if it's a package delivery or a cargo delivery that's going from one location to the next and it's not a high risk situation. But if you get into anything where you need a lot more sensor data to be shared simultaneously, I would expect those data rates to, to go up and for it to actually have some expense associated with it. Can you speak to how um, air traffic control works with eVTOLs and how, how that's happening now and how it will happen? Yeah, <clears throat> so I think this is an area really to come. So we've, what we've been working on is how do the drones connect with each other? How do the drones connect with the UTM system, the UAS traffic management system? Now we have to move into how does the UTM system connect with the ATM system? And, and even beyond you know, what we think about now is commercial airspace, thinking about the stratosphere, for example, you know, how do you have an air traffic management system that goes from the ground all the way up to the stratosphere and can coordinate all of those uses? Um, we don't have good answers for that right now. I think it's going to require a level of automation all the way through the stack that doesn't exist today, but that they're certainly working on at the lower altitudes. And so I would say, you know, we just need to keep working on and expanding that initial UTM work to see how we can uh, bring it higher in altitude. Cool. So yeah. what are you most looking forward to in the next year uh, that you're working on now or about to start? Yeah. So, um, and hi, PK, I see that you just joined. Um, you know, there are a number of regulatory things that we need to do to support all of the great innovation that I was just talking about. And, you know, how are we going to leverage these existing technologies and networks? The, you know, the how is really going to be in the regulation. Um, and so we need to finish, for example, our remote ID uh, regulatory framework. And Spectrum is certainly a big piece of that. Are we using unlicensed bands? Are we using licensed bands? Um, we need regulation around all of that and to make sure that we understand what's going to be acceptable uh, to be used. Uh, we need, uh, you know, the UTM regulatory system also to be put into place and we need to understand how all of these different federated um, UTM service suppliers are going to be, you know, functioning and talking with each other in the cloud. Uh, we need a way to type certify our um, unmanned aircraft, and they're working on that. Um, we need BB loss regulations, flight over people. We need counter UAS regulations. Um, so all I, I really do look forward to all of these proceedings uh, getting going and certainly getting finished. It's going to take a decent amount of time. And while all of that's happening, I think we need to be thinking very hard about smart cities. Um, because it really is a smart city infrastructure, all of this wireless and satellite, even the unlicensed bands and the aviation spe spectrum all together with fiber optics, with storage, with cloud computing, all of that is needed in order to support these new innovations in the air. So, um, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to getting that work going. I'm, I'm hearing some of that. Um, now people are starting to think about it and focus on it. NASA certainly is starting to think about it. There are different groups, uh, US Ignite and others around the country that are thinking about it and starting some testing in this area so that we can understand what those communications needs are and how we can leverage the, you know, the current commercial infrastructure and technology. So who should be working on this? Like who, what partners do you need to work on this? Um, so we need government, industry, and um, and innovators. So, and I would actually put NASA in sort of the innovator category. Um, you know, we need people that are doing the big think about these issues. NASA, um, helping to bring together all of the people that that are necessary, and then the people who are necessary are the communications carriers. Um, the you know the cities themselves i see bill saying smart cities i agree bill um the cities themselves uh the fcc the faa um all of them need to come together and to start really testing this out and testing out what's needed and and in a crawl walk run kind of format similar to the way nasa tested utm um you know 
we, we can start with, you know, what's needed to support a, a few drones lower to the ground and EVTOLs higher. And then in increasingly complex environments, we need to test this out and to make sure that you can have reliable service on the ground, safe and reliable service on the ground and safe and reliable service um, in the sky. And that it's all coordinated, right? And that you know what you would need to do in an, in an off nominal situation, you know, who gets priority and, and how you might accomplish that. One of the ways they talk about accomplishing that, I'll just say this one last thing and then I'll take a breath in case that you need to move me on to something else, um, is 5G slicing. So, you know, we don't have 5G yet. These networks are starting to get rolled out. 5G is uh, smaller cells, lower to the ground, denser uh, wireless coverage, capable of a great many things. So, um, and, and could be really cool for aviation because they can take a whole slice of the network, a 5G slice of the network, and dedicate it to unmanned aircraft. And by doing that, by dedicating it, you're almost creating a similar environment to what we have for um, aviation protected spectrum because you're saying this piece of spectrum is only going to be used by this industry and in these circumstances. And that might help to answer some of the questions and concerns that people have about using commercial networks because people are concerned that they're they're not potentially reliable for aviation if they're if you're also using it for you know commercial wireless services at large. So um, you know how can we create that safe and reliable environment? So we have a, another question. Are you assuming all autonomy or are you assuming five to 10 years of piloted vehicles first? Uh, yeah, great question. So um, I assume everything. Um, I assume that we are gonna have all different kinds of uh, operating plans and all different kinds of vehicles. And certainly, you know, when we talk about the spectrum needs, we, we always fold in what is the level of autonomy on the vehicle, how much, spectrum does it need in order to operate reliably? How often does it need to connect to the network? You know, how sophisticated is it? And if it has the capability of getting itself from one location to the next without having to be consistently in communication, then that is that needs to be modeled in, obviously. So yeah, if you have to assume the whole <laughs> the whole range. So uh, this is a question that has been popping up uh, in our polls and, and in our chats. What will the world of flying? I'm not sure I like? understand. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just say, ask me that again. <laughs> it sounded like you your phone popped up. up. Yeah. What will the What will the world of flying cars look like? What is it? What do you imagine it to be? Um. So. I probably thought about it most in the context of Los Angeles uh, because I've seen the plans there um, more than the plans for any other place. But I think about um, a hub and spoke type of operation, uh, you know, 20 different pathways in and out of the city. Um, I envisioned this happening on rooftops. I realize that there's been some like really amazing architecture done with respect to these um, special purpose vertiports. Um, but I think that we actually can leverage existing real estate in downtown areas. Um, I mean, I envision a, a world where we are all getting where we need to much faster, much safer, um, less congestion, fewer cars on the road. I, I really do envision a world where this is going to make a positive impact. Wow, that's amazing. So, and when do you think that this is gonna happen? Mm. <laughs> that's the, we should put PK on the hot spot. Um, <laughs> that's the magic question. Um, I think uh, it, I think we'll probably start to see some testing and I think Dallas Fort Worth might be one of the first areas where they're going to be testing in earnest um, over the next couple of years in certain corridors um, and just to prove the functionality and the safety and sort of the end to end system. Um, you know, I work with, for just for example, I work with an elevator company and they, they want to consider themselves part of urban mobility, right? So from, from your desk on through the elevator chute, out the door, 
you know, to the vertiport, to the aircraft, to your next location. They want to be part of that whole thing. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we'll start seeing it tested in more limited um, format over the next few years, but it, it's going to be a while before this is, uh, we've figured out all of the systems for small unmanned aircraft closer to the ground and these larger um, EV tells that are carrying passengers and cargo. That's awesome. I cannot wait for that to happen. So uh, yeah, with that, we're going to send people back to agilityprime.com for the moment uh, so they can pick another breakout or they can stay back with you and uh, have some more Q&A with you. But we recommend that you go to agilityprime.com and go to another breakout. Um, there are six other breakouts uh, that are about to start. And I want to thank you again, Jennifer, for an awesome conversation. I look forward to another one yeah. in a few minutes. Great. Perfect. Bobby. And I really do love that painting behind you. That is, uh, oh. <laughs> so if, if you want to tell the story of that for the people in the meantime. <laughs> sure. Well, when I was a young lawyer, I had been practicing law here in DC for three years, uh, not quite, and um, I was approached about becoming general counsel of a wireless company in Denver. And I moved from Washington, DC to Denver and rented a house and um, had to fill the house. So, um, you know, found this poster in Cherry Creek in Denver, fell in love with it. I have no relationship to fish at all, but just thought it was cool. Um, and went and had it framed and put it on my wall. It had a very prominent location in my little house in Denver. Um, and then, and I was dating and um, this person that I was dating, uh, who ended up becoming my husband, happens to be a fly fisherman and trout is his thing. So when he walked into my house and saw this, I think he, he and, he and I both ended up thinking that was a sign. Um, so anyway, it was in the house in Denver uh, and then it was in our house in Georgetown. And now it's in our house. We live, still live in DC, but not in Georgetown anymore. Um, but it's still one of my favorite pieces. I like it too. It's awesome. The artist is, yeah, Judy Haas. Judy Haas. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, thank you for coming to our breakout. Um, we are here. Uh, and Jennifer, would you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Jennifer Richter. I'm a partner with Aiken Gump in Washington, D.C. And I've had the pleasure, really, of working on some pretty complex puzzles um, with NASA and the FCC and the FAA and industry over the last few years about how are we going to connect unmanned aircraft uh, with each other, with the ground, with UTM systems, with ATM systems. Um, what are those communication solutions that we need? So we're talking about command and control and detect and avoid and remote ID and um, I'm sure I'm missing some, um, but all, you know, all of these different communication systems that are really essential and foundational in order to have safe and secure and reliable flights. So you were, we were talking a few minutes ago about the regulations that need to be put in place before orbs become a reality. Can you give us some information yeah. about that? Yeah, um, there's actually quite a bit that needs to be done. So uh, right now we're in the middle of the remote ID rulemaking um, at the FAA. We, all the comments have been filed, I think 50,000 comments. And having a remote ID system is really foundational. Um, of course, we need to have ways of identifying and tracking these um, unmanned aircraft. Um, then we also need rules and regulations for uh, UTM systems. The Federation of UTM Service Suppliers are going to be working together to create um, a common cloud-based dashboard that will ensure safe travel. That UTM system needs to connect to an ATM system, so we're going to need, you know, technology and rules and regulations that enable all of that to happen. We need um, regulations around type certification for unmanned aircraft and package delivery in particular. Um, that there is actually a rulemaking ongoing right now um, at the FAA on that topic. We need regulations for beyond visual line of sight, um, for flight over people. We need regulations for counter UAS. So when somebody is flying that shouldn't be, 
or has nefarious intent, how can we take those drones out of the air? It's a huge issue. Um, how do we protect critical infrastructure from drones? So a lot of critical infrastructure is using drones, which is great, but how do we protect our critical infrastructure from drones that might have nefarious intent? Um, and then there's, you know, gosh, there's regulatory proceedings ongoing just related to the spectrum itself for these communication systems. So the FCC and the FAA are working right now on a, a 374 report to Congress um, about spectrum solutions for command and control of UAS. Do they have to use aviation protected spectrum? Could they use other commercially available spectrum like the wireless networks or the satellite networks? Um, what are the obstacles to using any of these uh, particular solutions? Um, right now, a uh, super proceeding going on at the FCC related to spectrum that could be used for collision avoidance. Um, so there's spectrum that for collision avoidance on the ground for cars, but could that same spectrum be used in the air for collision avoidance? And a number of parties have have uh, filed comments at the FCC on that issue. And so that's pending right now. So that gives you a flavor. There's just a ton that needs to be done. I mean, really, and we talked about this the last session, both from a practical perspective, from like the testing and the standards, that all needs to be done. Um, and then we need the regulations that will support all of that. So one of the things that I spoke about yesterday uh, with uh, the CEO, Matt Chasen of Lift Aviation, uh, Lift Aircraft, oh, yeah. sorry, um, is that a lot of these UAVs, uh, oh, sorry, a, a lot of the eVTOLs are um, one, one person only, one pilot. So the training is going to have to be uh, virtual. So one of the, like, so how are we going to do the licensure for the pilots if it's going to have to be virtual? Yeah. Correct. Great question. So I would say, um, gosh, that's such a next next evolution question, but it's a good question. Sorry. Um, the uh, right? No, I think it's right, right. We have to think about all these things, right? Because we don't. I mean, the fact is, let's just start with you know the beginning. We don't have enough pilots for the aircraft that we have functioning today, right? So how are we going to get more pilots and more remote remote pilots trained? Um, and then pilots that might might actually, you know, pilot these EVTOL aircraft, although some of them also will be unmanned. So I think um, VR, AR technology is how a lot of this will be done. But then you need systems that, that can understand everything in the physical world um and that can recreate that in an augmented reality or virtual reality scenario so that you can get that testing done I mean, it's probably similar to the flight simulators that nasa and, and the big airlines are using today but we have to think about new paradigms and and we have to regulate those as well and come up with the licensure and, and all that so it has to be focused in with that so, yeah. oh, and uh, Carl says that he'll be talking about it, the training and licensing issue on the panel today. So thank you, Carl, for-, for Awesome. <laughs> so back to uh, your expertise then. Um, so what is coming down the pipeline? What is the thing that is getting, keeping you up at night right now? You know, um, what really preoccupies me is the, the the holistic question of how is all of this going to work together and so I like to just think about urban mobility broadly and I like to think about how unmanned aircraft and EV tolls fit into that so we've got we're going to have automated vehicles on the ground and in the air and all different kinds of systems for supporting them many of those systems are the systems that we use today for communicating with each other those systems can provide the kind of on-demand, real-time, safe, secure, reliable uh, communications that we need in order to keep all of these vehicles and all of the humans around them safe. But how are we going to, you know, how are we going to accomplish that? There aren't, today, there really aren't that many smart cities that could even accommodate all of this. So much infrastructure development is needed. So much is, you know, we need to learn so much about what is, what is needed just 
for the aircraft, um, for command and control, for detect and avoid. Detect and avoid is a huge area that is just uh, not well understood. And certainly we don't have the technology testing or the regulations to support it. Um, so I'm actually just gonna stop there on DAA for a moment. This actually is a huge problem. So when anybody goes to the FAA and says, I want to fly this unmanned aircraft beyond visual line of sight, which certainly would be true for an eVTOL, they say, what's your detect and avoid solution? And how are you linking into a, an unmanned aircraft uh, UAS traffic management system? Like, how, you know, how are you accomplishing this? And there really isn't a good answer to DAA. Um, there are technologies, there are a number of proprietary technologies that are out there that people are testing and using, Ecodyne, Fordham, companies that are working on these. Um, but there isn't a, you know, a spectrum band available from the FCC to accomplish this. Just like the railroads, they don't have spectrum for um, positive train control. You know, we need the spectrum resources and we need the technologies and it needs to be in an open system that everyone can buy into and, and work in together. Um, I mean, that's just, <laughs> that's just one issue, right? Um, I, I probably have done the most work on the command and control issues because that's been more front and center for everybody and then secondarily on the remote ID system. Um, you know, I think there's a lot known about those areas and the kinds of technologies that can be used and spectrum solutions that can be used, but DAA is one that's uh, really not well developed at this point and something that we all need to be working on, government, industry, everyone together. And another thing that you mentioned before was that uh, the cybersecurity risks are, are high or un unknown yeah. at this point. It's true, and there are issues there from both a law enforcement perspective and an industry perspective. So, um, you know, right now under Title 18, there are just a few government um, agencies, administrations that can use counter UAS, the Department of Justice, the Department of Energy, the Department of Defense. Um, in the Department of Transportation, you know, it's just not something that really can be used widely. So it's not something that law enforcement has in their toolbox, for example. And it's not something that our critical infrastructure has in their toolbox either. So when they come to us and they say, you know, we're, there are these unmanned aircraft that are flying around our facilities, how can we stop them? The answer is, there's almost nothing you can do. You can post it as a no drone zone, you could maybe use attack dog drones to back off drones if you kind of knew the drones were coming. So that might mean you have to use some kind of acoustic detection technology. Um, but there's there's little that you can do. It It is, I would say, certain that those drones are not operating within the Part 107 regulations. So those are drones that are operating illegally, but how are you going to enforce it? And we just don't have those mechanisms today. Um, and that is an issue both for government, for law enforcement, and for, for industry. And even for the eVTOL makers, uh, for, for the manufacturers, thinking forward to what happens when we have these craft in the air, we don't want to risk yeah. uh, somebody breaking into the system like when the early electric cars were stopped on the road yeah. by hackers. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely right. And I, well, and thank you very much because that goes to the communication solutions and the need for, you need, you know, we think we talk about leveraging commercial technologies and commercial wireless networks and maybe even commercial unlicensed spectrum, commercial satellite networks to help us guide these unmanned vehicles, whatever they are. Um, but those systems need to be safe and secure. We need to make sure that they can't be hacked and that people can't take over a drone uh, remotely and fly it into um, the Pentagon, right? I mean, we have to, the safety and security and the reliability needs to be thought through the entire system beginning to end. So uh, one of the questions we were asked before was, how are we like? How can this work with air traffic control with with our lands 
down. Yeah, I mean, how, how is this going to work in the future? Um, so it's a great question. Um, I think uh, we need to think about the next generation of air traffic management. And we need to think about um, UAS traffic management and the digital cloud-based systems that are developing there. And we need to think about how that is gonna be integrated with air traffic management. And then even with managing aircraft that are up in the stratosphere. Um, and the, we have to be thinking about how the whole stack is integrated uh, from the ground up, you know, up through the commercial navigable airspace and into the stratosphere. Um, Probably a lot of those systems will be automated. Um, that is not the way the systems are run today. So, uh, so we need to be thinking about that and working on that. And I know the next gen office is working on that um, at the FAA. But you know, it takes integration and interoperability of all of these systems. So, what can industry do um, to help the government? work through these issues that you're having mm -hmm. to help move regulation forward uh, with the problems that you're having? Yeah, uh, testing and engagement are the two answers. So um, testing is actually a very big uh, issue right now. Um, the FAA is wanting to support use of commercial wireless, commercial satellite networks to support unmanned aircraft in addition to the aviation spectrum, but they can see that there are limitations to the aviation spectrum. They need more, but they need to understand how it functions and it needs to be tested, test, test, test. Um, it is being tested, but those results are not all being shared with the FAA. So we have worked through some testing metrics. If anybody's watching this and wants to know what the testing metrics are, I'm happy to send them and connect you with the right people at the FAA. Um, the FAA needs to understand that it's safe and secure, but the FCC has a different mandate. The FCC is really all about technology coexistence and, and keeping things from interfering with each other. And so the, the FCC also needs testing information. They wanna know when you have basically a modem that's flying and transmitting at altitude down to the ground, how is that impacting the networks on the ground? And how do the ground networks impact the networks in the air? How can we do all of this safely and securely? Um, and in a way that is compatible, right? Technology coexistence. So uh, the FCC also needs the testing information. So um, as we think about, you know, thematically, as we think about leveraging commercial technologies, network systems that are available today for other purposes, we, these are great ideas and the government wants to embrace them, but they can't do that without the testing. And so a lot of testing needs to be done. I'm hoping that NASA will lead the way on some of that. Industry also needs to be doing that and there needs to be a lot of transparency with the government around that. Is there any standardization then it, in the testing yet? Um, well, that's what, so that at least with respect to using the commercial wireless networks, there is a testing sort of a rubric, a set of metrics that we put together and agreed to with the FAA. And so that there is some consistency there, uh, but that that's needed, right? And with respect to any testing that occurs, we need to make sure that the same kinds of information is being reported back so that our regulators can make conclusions based upon them. Um, and I told you there were two parts. There was the testing and there was the engagement. On the engagement side, um, we need smart people who are able to do this testing also to then advocate for what they think the rules and the regulations need to be at the agency in order to support all of this. You know, this is just a long, long uh, set of challenges uh, to be addressed, um, but all of it is necessary. So from the testing through the, the regulatory and the policy advocacy, it's, it's all really necessary. So what are the, um, what do you think the first usage uh, or widespread usage of, of the orbs will be? Um, you know, I thought passenger travel was going to be first. And I think certainly there's a lot of interest in that with respect to 
you know, the work that Uber Elevate is doing and the work that Airbus has been doing um, and others. Uh, I hear though now more talk about cargo, about uh, EV tolls that are carrying cargo one location to another, you know, helping with logistics. Um, and certainly as part of COVID relief, we've seen some of that happening. Um, so now these are not um, the kind of, you know, passenger drones that you've seen lots of pictures of, probably smaller uh, drones, but heavy enough that they can carry a substantial amount of cargo operating <laughs> from ships into city centers, um, from hospitals um, into city centers to you know residential areas. I mean, we're seeing lots of really interesting testing in that area right now. So anyway, that's just a long way of saying I thought passengers might be first, but I think it's probably likely to be cargo. It sounds like you're going to need a lot of help from cities to get that usage in place. Yeah, yeah, but definitely, yeah. I mean, partnering with cities is probably the number one thing on a development plan. So when you have a bright idea that you want to bring this really cool new technology to a city, you've really got to sit down with the city managers and politicians right from the start and explain to them what you intend to do and what the benefits for the community might be and what you need from them. Um, what kinds of assets do they have that they could bring to bear and what what kinds of benefits can you bring to the community we've we've heard this done well and very poorly in some major cities and when it's done poorly it's really um, a huge roadblock the the notion that the city needs to be a smart city and it needs a lot of digital infrastructure and I, we talked about this in the last session but you need everything from robust fiber optics and robust wireless to edge computing and um, advanced storage capabilities and cloud computing, <coughs> pardon me, all of this needs to be working together in order to enable the city to support unmanned aircraft lower to the ground and, and higher. And, uh, and then of course, uh, connecting into the air traffic management system, which we talked about earlier as well. Are there so any locations, a, you know, many systems. Go are ahead. there any locations that are better suited for this testing for that are going to jump ahead? <clears throat> yes, um, there are. One, some of the areas where we've seen some really interesting testing going on in this area are military bases, actually, <clears throat> because there are the kinds of environments where it's controlled enough that you can deploy all of the necessary infrastructure and test it out and and uh, it's it's easy to deploy and test in these environments. Um, there are some cities that are on their way to having enough fiber optics and wireless and all the other things that we talked about that they too could support this. It's trickier because unless you're going along a corridor uh, a rail line or maybe the the transmission line, some kind of corridor where you don't have people underneath you, it's it's much trickier for the city to authorize that. So in Dallas, Fort Worth, where they're going to be test, testing the passenger drones, they're going to be using, a I think, an air corridor between Dallas and Fort Worth that is an established corridor that doesn't have people under it, you know, that you, you know, can test this new technology and it can be safe. So the, you know, the cities care about the safety and security issues. They care about the equity issues. You know, they wanna make sure that when these new kinds of urban mobility technologies are brought to the city, it isn't just the wealthy that are getting access to it, that there'll be benefits for everyone. Um, so the cities have lots of different issues on their minds, but but certainly the um, the safety is the the number one concern. And so testing this out in controlled environments like a military base is um, often what is desirable. Well, thank you. This has been really fascinating, uh, and I'm really excited sure. to hear more about. Uh, 
all of the regulation changes that are coming up and, and seeing the, the integration with the smart cities. Is there anything, uh, last, last words that you want to say to everyone that's listening? Um, no, I guess I would just say these are really um, exciting and challenging times, right? Lots of challenges and opportunities, but uh, the, the future of what we're all creating together really is exciting. Um, and I think that these advances will be um, improving uh, life and environment uh, for all of us. And so it's, it's just going to take a tremendous amount of hard work by all of us together, industry and government pulling together. Uh, to find the right technologies and test them out and get them deployed and get those right regulations in place. Great. Well, thank you, Jennifer Richter. Um, everyone, please head back to agilityprime.com and uh, you'll see this afternoon session about to start. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.